So today we are going to look at one example in handling character strings stored as single dimensional arrays. Yesterday in the extra lecture I had discussed a few things. Uh, within a couple of days we will put that also as a video lecture on, uh, on your home page. Although I did not use any slides, so I am afraid you will have to look at uh, the web page uh, video itself. However, I will take one example, primarily an example of separating out first and last name if both are entered with some blanks in between and they are read as a single string. So they should sort of give you an indication of how blanks are handled in character strings. We shall also discuss the course projects and as usual I will have brief announcements at the end. So the problem is that if I have been given two names on a line, how do I read that line in? As I said, you cannot use the C in function because the C in operator in C++ actually eats away all white blanks, white spaces, etc. and automatically extracts useful information on the line that you type. It could be the name, it could be a value, it could be a floating point number, whatever it is, and it appropriately assigns it to whatever variable or array you are reading it in. That is not useful if you have to handle a complete line as a single record as you are required to do in the assignment for lab 7. So as an example, we will take a record to consist of two strings, one is the first name of a person, second is the second name of the person separated by a few blanks. We will see how exactly we can take these out and print them. So here we are defining the usual <coughs> includes. Notice that apart from the inclusion of string, there is another hash include called C string. This C string represents all those library functions which are traditionally part of the C programming language. The original inclusion used to be hash include string dot h. But when you go to C++ compiler, C++ compiler also recognizes it by the name C string. So we will include all of these things in our program. These are the main declarations in our program. So let's understand what we are going to use different variables and arrays for. The first line says char line 256. This I expect naturally to read an entire line from the keyboard or any file inside my machine. Now usually the line that you see on your uh, screen is about 80 characters long. Names would usually be 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 characters long including first name and last name. However, remember that whenever you are trying to read a record as a complete line, there is no point in being stingy in allocating small memory to it. So therefore, 256 is a good value to allocate to a record which you want to read as a line. The line may contain numbers, commas, full stops, characteristics, values, whatever. What. An interesting declaration is star char ptr. This is a character pointer. When I declare it, it doesn't point to anything, but it creates a placeholder in memory. The value inside this char pointer will not be a normal numeric value. As we have seen last time, the value inside will be pointing to an address in memory location. Typically, char pointers are used to point to positions inside character string arrays. You can access an element inside an array by a numerical position. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, which is the array index. You can also access it by a character pointer. We shall see the difference. Immediately thereafter, you see char name string as 60. So you presume that the name that you will get in two parts totally will not exceed 60 characters, a reasonable assumption. Then you have two additional character strings declared, first name and last name. Please notice that when I declare them as 60, the actual positions will be 0 to 59 and the 59th position will be expected to be occupied by a slash null or zero value character. 
which indicates the end of string in any character string array in C++. So that means your effective length of the name is only 59 and not 60. I have declared two more arrays, first name and last name because the problem says I expect first name and last name as two different parts on the line and I have to separate these out. Obviously the first name and last name individually will be smaller than the full name but I do not know that. So I assume that in the worst case either first name or last name could be larger than whatever I may assume. I might therefore put the same size as name string. Then I declare a string type called line string. Notice that this line string is different from line 256 char array. Although it is what I am expecting to read when I use the get line function on C in. This line string length is not determined by me. C++ is intelligent enough to read all the material that you characters that you type till the new line character. When you hit the new line character that is considered that is when you press return on your on your machine while giving input that is considered the end of the line. So whatever characters you have typed C++ is capable of accumulating all of them in a string variable called line string. This is not to be confused with the C type character arrays. So we will need some conversion to get that line which has been read into line string into our line which is the char line 256. I have additional things int n char. This n char I am going to use to indicate the number of characters in my uh, string that I get. I do not know how many because I may not get exactly 60 although that is the limit I have. It may be less, it may be more. I also have an integer value called blank pos which indicates the blank position because I need to separate out things depending upon the blanks. I have two additional variables length f and length l. I use them to denote the length of the first name and length of the last name. I have usual indexing variable i. So is the declaration clear in the purpose? Ordinarily in a regular program I would have written adequate comments to explain what these variables and arrays are meant for. I now give an instruction type a name and then I say get line c in comma line string. This is a function available in the string library of C++. The first name is name of a file. C in is the standard input file but if I had declared any other name I could have used that to read data from. So when I say c in line string I would actually get the entire line that I would type on my keyboard into a variable called line string. I do not know how big is that string. So I have another function actually it is an operator because line string is an object not really a variable or an array. That object dot length is the way I invoke the function within the object class line string and when I say line string dot length no parameter required this will actually calculate the exact length of what is there in the line string the value, uh, the number of characters that I have collected and that will be assigned to n char. So n char will represent the total number of characters inside the, no, not counting the backslash null or whatever it is, it's just the total number of characters inside this link. So these two simple functions help me to get a line and this function helps me to get the length of the line, the meaningful line. Now you notice that I want to deal with character arrays. That is an array in which I have, I, I will handle the character string. That string I had defined, if you look back, I had defined this as name string 60. So what I do is I want to start getting the characters in the name string. I set name string n char equal to 0. Can you guess what does this mean? I am actually putting a backslash 0 or a null character into the last position in my string where I already know the length of the string from the previous function which is n, n char. So in the n carth position suppose n char is 40 
what it means actually is that the length of the string is 40. So 40th position will contain backslash 0. 0 to 39 positions will contain the actual characters. Of course, I expect the NCAR to be less than uh, 59 really in number. Whatever. The comments indicate that now I am looking at reading the line string in the CAR array. Now for that, there is another function called mem copy or memory copy. My string exists in memory. My name string array also exists in memory. So string library provides a function called memcpy, wherein I list the name string, that is the string into which I want to copy, line string from which I want to copy. Now since line string is an object, you don't use a normal function on line string, but there is an operator called C underscore string. What does this operator do to line string? It takes the contents of the line string and extracts all the characters from that line string, converts them into C type array and puts them into the name string, which is an array pointed out by the name string. Okay. In cat is the number of characters. Observe that instead of calculating the length of the string separately, I could have actually used here that entire object dot function to calculate the length. That is also all. So what do I have now at the end of this mem copy? I have inside the single array named str the entire line that you have stored as a C character string. Hopefully it has a first name followed by a blank followed by the last name. I am now writing a program to locate the first name. Car PTR equal to car star mem car name string comma blank comma n car. What does it do? What do you expect it to do? It will actually locate the first blank inside name string we give the length up to which it has to search. So this is actually a search function. Mem chr is a search function. There is a corresponding search function which will operate upon the C type array of the C library as well. Notice that last time I had given you a whole lot of function names. Okay. So if you look at any standard information on C or C++ libraries, which is there on internet, just search for C++ string, for example you will get the names of all these functions and what they perform. However, here I am using this function, but notice that I will not get a position of the space. I will get instead a care pointer. There is a fundamental difference between a position and a care pointer. Both point to the same location, but they point in different ways. A numerical position would be an array index, 13, 14, 15, 21. A care pointer will also be an index but it will indicate a position through a pointer variable. So suppose I had written, I had executed this program, hopefully I will have something like type the name in two parts on a line. This is not the, syn the syntax that I have used in the program. Program prints a different message, but some such message. And suppose I give this line, first one blank, last. You would have understood by now that the first blank last would now go into an array like this. F I R S T one blank L A S T and back black slash zero. There could be some elements in the array because the array is larger. It has 60 elements, but we don't care what the remaining elements of the array contain because they don't matter. The point that I was making is that if I have an integer variable, say i, then I will use the value of i as 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. These will be integer position. What I am calculating using that function is not a numerical value. So I am getting a star pointer. The PTR may have absolutely any value as we have seen, some hexadecimal value. But the PTR means that the PTR will point either here or here, etc., etc. In our case, the function will return a pointer to the first blank. 
that means our pointer which is I think CAR PTR this will point to this position. Now I want to get the position of this. How will I get the position of this? I have a pointer here but I also have a pointer to this element. Because this is an array, the array name itself is the first position. The array name 2 will be a pointer because the array name itself is the pointer. As I mentioned to you, when we pass array names to functions, values are not passed. The pointer to the first element is passed. Consequently, the array name in C++ itself is a pointer to the first element. What was the array name that we had used? We had used name string. So name string can be used in two ways. I can use anything like this will mean ith element of name string. However, if I just use name string, it is a pointer to the first location. Now using this, these two pointers, I can actually find out a numerical position of the blank. Simple, I subtract this value from this and I add 1 to 8, I should get the point. I should get the numerical value. So this is what I have tried to do here. So I locate the first space using char ptr equal to char star mem char name string blank n char. This char star is called casting. The value calculated may be an integer, may be something else. If you want to convert that value appropriately from an uh, integer to a character pointer or you care pointer to a character pointer, whichever way, you can actually cast the result. This can be applied for any expression. So suppose you write a floating point expression and you want to convert a value to integer, you can before assigning to integer value, in front of that expression, if you put inside the bracket int, then the whole value will be converted to int. It is called casting a value in a different type. It's a fairly powerful facility. We use this to convert whatever value is written by this function into a character pointer and assign it to char ptr. Now notice the next one. If char ptr is not null, why am I checking for that? I may not have any blank in the whole string. Somebody has goofed up in giving, a, instead of giving me two names separated by a blank, fellow gives only one, one name, no blank, and carriage return. Now that means there will be no space. So my function will return what? It will return a null. That is the essence of the memcar. Either it finds a position, in which case it gives a pointer, otherwise the pointer is null. The null pointer is Notice that null pointer is different from a null value within an array element. In fact, in C, C++, a null pointer like this is considered the most troublesome person in the world. The creator of this null pointer has recently confessed that Turing Award winner, he said that I should have avoided null pointers. So this is a very dangerous thing. Every time you use pointers, you better be sure that your pointer is not null before you use the pointer to access anything or to use it in any computation. So we make sure that the character is not null. That means I have found one blank. If I have found one blank, I have to get the first name. The first name, as we saw, is between the beginning and the first blank. That is supposed to be the first name. So I will just find out the position of the blank as equal to char pointer minus name string plus one. So pointer to blank, the pointer to first position, difference plus one. That is the position of the blank in, in integer num. So blank pos will now get this. I will print out form blank at blank pos and I will set the length of the first name as blank pos. So let's just very briefly look at the array once again in the example. This is actually the whole string. 
I have F I R S T. Assume that this is the name. This position will be fourth position, and this position will be fifth position. So this is pointing here. This is pointing here, and the pointer difference plus one gives me the total number of characters. So this is the blank position. Blank position I will get as five. When I get blank position as five, that is also the length of the string. Because the first name will have one, two, three, four, five characters. Of course, this is the sixth position in the array. So, in the sixth position, I will have to put a backslash zero. So, length of f, I set it as blank pos. The value of blank pos will be six. The element was fifth because we started counting from zero. I will copy n characters from a string. There is another function called str n copy. There are two functions: str cpy, which copies an entire string, and str n cpy, which copies n characters as specified by you. I am copying from name string, which is the original string that I got, into a string called first name. That is my array, which will hold the first name. And how many characters I want to copy? Length f. So length f characters will be copied. I want to make sure that the first name array contains a proper C++ string in an array, so I will put at the length of position a zero, which is a backslash zero. So the whole string is guaranteed now to become a null terminated string. So just to recapitulate, I first copy the given input string into a character array, then I locate the first space by using memcar, which is a search function. After locating that, I confirm that the pointer returned is not null. If it is not null, I have found one blank, and I can get the first name by just finding out its position and copying that part of the string into first name. Now I proceed to look at the second part of the name. I have assumed so far that first name and second name is separated by only one blank. But what if somebody gives two blanks or three blanks? Then obviously I have to gloss over those blanks. I should not count them. I first output the first name for i equal to zero, i less than length f, i plus plus, c out less less first name i. Observe that this will put one character at a time, and all the characters in this array will be put out. After which I put an end l. C out end l is not part of the for statement. The for statement scope starts here and ends here. This is because I am using it on a on a uh, slide, so I am shortening the length. Otherwise, I would have written it in proper form. So after outputting all the characters in the string, I will just output an end of line. Now, I know the position where the first blank was found, but I do not know whether there are subsequent blanks also. If there are, I must skip them. That is why I have written a small part of code. Which skips consecutive blanks, if any. What it does, it looks at the blank pos position of name string itself. If it is equal to blank, it simply increments blank plus plus plus. So this is the this is the while loop. If I find a blank, I increment blank pos. Observe that blank pos has no purpose in my life anymore. It has found out the first blank position. So I can continuously update blank pos to move towards next position, next position, next position, till I find a non-blank character. So while the character is blank, I increment the blank pos. However, I must check whether there are only blanks until the end and nothing more. Somebody has cheated me, given only one part, left a lot of blanks, and then pressed the end of return, end of line. So if I hit the end of line itself. Then I must say there is no other name. That is what I do here. If blank pos is equal to n cal, that means I have completed the entire length of the string and I have still not located anything. Then I will say c out no last name end l. However, I break out of the complete program because there is no point in continuing my program any further. I simply say return one. So I print the message that there is only first name. There is nothing else, and I get out. But if this is not true, if indeed somebody has given a valid second name, then this while loop will end here, and when the while loop ends, 
I would have skipped all consecutive blanks. Consequently, when I come out, my blank pause would have hit the position which is a non-blank character. So I now print the last name. What is the length of the second name? The length last name is n car minus blank pause. Observe that n car was the total length of the character string and blank pause now points to the first non-blank character in the, in the second part because of the skipping of the blanks that I have done. So this will give me the length of last name. Now I again use string n copy, last name, name string plus blank pause and length here. Notice that strn copy copies from one string to another as many characters as you prescribe. If I just said copy from name string to last name, it will start copying from the first position in name string. That is nonsense. Because the first position in name string contains the first name. I want it to believe that the string that I am giving for copying actually does not start from the first position but starts somewhere else. And where should it start from? Where my non-blank character is. And that is why I treat this as a pointer, name string, plus blank pause. That is the first non-blank character position. So I, this, this becomes a pointer which will point to the middle of the string where the second name begins. And how many characters I am copying? Length L. This will get me everything into last name array to make sure the length Lth element of last name is set to zero, which is backslash zero. So consequently in second name, that is last name also, I have a valid name. I will print it out by some message first and then again for i equal to zero, length L, i plus plus, C out, last name i. I have not bothered to put opening brass and closing brass because a single statement after for loop automatically starts and begins, ends the scope of the for iteration. So consequently the next line, C out, end L is actually end of line. That means I will just print end of line. If this is not so, else, C out, name has only one word. Observe that this else does not correspond to any if here. We will have to go back one slide. Let's go back here. Notice, we had said here, if blank pause equal equals n car, we had said no last name. And if I have not found any non-blank character after the first name, then I will say the name has only one word, end name. Here are some execution results. I type a name here, let's say my friend Nanlal, one blank Sarda. The program will output, found blank at 8. So notice 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Eighth position is blank. First name is Nanlal, last name is Sarda. The program works correctly. As I told you, however, in real life, you cannot make assumptions about data being correct. People may type in data wrongly and the mistakes could be of any kind. That is where you need to validate the data. What my program does is it does some very simple, almost trivial validations. In real life, you'll have to do many validations. For example, suppose instead of typing, typing Nanlal, I typed N-A-N-D, comma, semicolon L. Now, can that be the name of a person? Generally, it is not tradition to name people with commas and semicolons. So, I should be able to look at that name string and say, sorry, this doesn't look to me to be the right name. But maybe somebody in Timbuktu have names like that. So, I leave that to human beings to decide whether I got a right name or wrong name. But I must print a message and a warning saying it does not look like a right name. In your projects, you will be spending a lot of your programming skills in validating data and giving messages for wrong data. Even in this simple program, let us see some examples. Here is the next example. I have typed my name with lots of blanks in between. As you observed in the program, I have taken care of skipping the blanks. So that is why when the program is executed, it says found blank at 7. Notice 7 is this position, but they blank at 8, 9, 10, whatever. 
However, the program correctly prints first name is Deepak, second name is Fatih. So, the program is sturdy enough to withstand multiple blanks between two different parts. Let us again execute it with some other data. I type one name, Sridhar. The program correctly says name has only one word. Don't cheat me. However, look at what happens when I type Kavi Arya with lots of blanks ahead of Kavi, then Kavi, then lots of blanks, then Arya. Now what will my program do? It locates the first blank, unfortunately not between these two words, but here itself. Found blank at one. What it means? It assumes that first name is null. Because the string starts at zero, blank is found at one, so the last character is also at zero. It actually prints first name as nothing. Now, as per my program, the blanks will be skipped till it finds a non-blank character. It finds capital K, it says, ah, I found this surname. And from that point till end of the string, it will print that as the last name. So my friend Kavi suddenly has lost his first name and Kavi Arya has become his second name. That is unfair. This is just to illustrate that you have to be very, very careful when you deal with real life data. In fact, the second assignment example is precisely to convey to you that when data is entered by different people, there could be lots of mistakes. And you have to provide for those mistakes. And you have to either give warnings or make suitable assumptions and even make corrections. When you correct wrong data like that, it is called data cleansing. You cleanse the data. Saban laga ke dote. So you, 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 for example, here you should be able to figure out logically that if such is the case, the leading blanks should be removed. If you remove all leading blanks, then you will print Kavi Arya's name and recognize Kavi Arya's name correctly. I leave it to you to think about this when you look, when you complete the second sign. When we print data, we have been using see out statement. The see out statement is not always very good because it does not align the printing properly. I would like printing to look neat, look pretty. So Professor Sony had some examples I thought I will include them here. Look at the normal see out. Suppose I am outputting a 2 by 2 matrix and the matrix elements are 1, 2, 3, 45, 6, 7 here. The first two elements are one digit numbers and the second row has three digit numbers. Now if I just execute this program, just see out AIJ and at the end I put NL after the J loop so that the first row is printed in first line and second row is printed in second line. What the output will look like is 1 blank 2. 3, 4, 5, blank 6, 7, 8. Now it is not very clear if I have large output like this, then all my positions in the array which I would like to visibly see would get all this stuff. You will recall when I had shown you the histogram and the image pixel values, they were adjusted so that you could make sense that this is first pixel, this is second pixel, this is eighth pixel and so on. You would like therefore the printing that you do to appear appropriate or pretty. For that purpose, there is another command which is not C out, but a command which is called printf. This is a function. This is a C style function. So instead of saying C, C out, if you say printf followed by prescription inside the brackets for how the value should be printed and what value should be printed. So this is a replacement of C out. I thought I will very briefly describe what does this function do. So I would like ideally the printout to be one. So blank, blank, one. Blank, 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 two, etc. I would like the output to be like this. How would I get an output like this? This is done by using the printf function. The printf function has what we call format specifiers. A format specifier is a string which declares how a particular output should look like. Unfortunately, the syntax of the format specifier is very funny. It always starts with a percent symbol. If I say percent 6D, this is a specifier to say that some integer value is to be printed, print it as a six digit integer. Observe that if I say this, 
the integer value will be printed right justified in the six places. It will not appear arbitrary. Percent s means print a string. I am not specifying the length, so string will be printed as is. But if I say percent 7s, that means string is to be fitted in seven character spaces. If the string is smaller, it should be padded with blank. If the string is larger, it should be truncated. Percent 8.2f, this is a specification for floating point printing. That means the value that is to be printed is float. Total eight digit space is to be occupied, out of which two digits should be after decimal point. 8.2g is a similar specification, but if it, it says that if you cannot accommodate the value in this field, because either the precision is larger or the number is very small or big, for example, if you have a number which is say 2.7 into 10 to the power minus 90. Now when printed as decimal, it will be 0 .0000000, 000 000 000 000 000, so many zeros and then 27. Now in this 8.2 format, I will only get zeros. So 8.2G says that the same floating point number, but switch to E notation if required. Here are some examples. They are simple examples, but I would request you to try out many such examples by giving arbitrary value, giving format strings, and then trying to see what you get as the output. So here I have three variables, A, B, and C, which are integer, and three variables, P, Q, and R, which are floating point. First, let us look at the integer variable. I have assigned a value A equal to minus 1, B equal to 10, C equal to 100. Let us look at the printing that happens. Print F, percent 5D, backslash n a notice that what is given as format specifier is a string you can give multiple format specifications and give multiple values to be printed you can look at any example and see that in a book what this does is it prints the value of a in a five character space so observe that minus one will be printed like this there are five spaces assume that the starting of the printer line is here so this will be put in the last two positions. When you print B, it will print 10 like this. When you print C, it will print 100 like this. Can you see it will be a very useful thing to align numerical values appropriately? Consider printf percent 2. If you say percent 2D, then minus 1 will be printed in two spaces. B, which is 10, can also be accommodated in two places. C, however, is 100. Now, just because you have asked it to print only in two spaces. It will not print 0, 0 or 1, 0. A programming language, COBOL, does that actually. Depending upon the picture of the printout data value, it will print only so many digits. So we have had problems when 10,000 became 0, 0, 0, 0. Here, however, C++ will print 100 properly. Here are examples of floating point numbers. I have values for P, Q, and R as 123.456, 0 0.1234, etc., and they are printed like this. You should now try to adapt printf wherever you can, particularly for the final results which you are going to print out. I am suggesting this. You can do it for your practice programs that you use, but most certainly all project outputs must look neat, not haphazardly. There is a lot of work to be done to decide on the proper messages, to decide on the proper error messages, to decide on the proper output messages, and that work is integral part of any good program. Just because the logic of the program is right, the program does not become a good program. It is a working program. It becomes a good program when it is properly documented within, and when it produces output which is well documented. I will very briefly re-describe the projects that we had. I had a meeting with the team leaders. Unfortunately, all team leaders were not present. Unfortunately, all teams have not yet been formed. I have advised all the present team leaders, and that will be, in fact, part of the assignment this week in the lab. You have to complete formation of team by midnight tomorrow. There will be five teams of four students each who will form a lab batch. In each lab batch, there must be five teams. There are lab batches which have only 17 students. Then form teams of three students each with few teams of four students. 
Four student is a norm. It can be violated only if you have more than 20 students. If you have more than 20 students, it is not permitted to have a batch, one batch of three students and few batches of five students. The minimum size of the batch is four. It will, one batch can be either three or five in the extreme cases. Please also remember to balance out the batches. I have found, and that is natural, that either a few friends or few people who have a lot of programming experience, they team up together to form a team. Very good, that will be a very strong team. But remember, the project evaluation, which has 25 marks, has 15 marks for the project. If the entire project is not done well, because just one team is very weak, the whole project report may get only 5 marks out of 25. And every member of the strongest team will also get 5 marks. Every member of the weakest team will also get 5 marks. This is the first lesson in any group work. Balance out the assignment of work. So please ensure that there is no weak team in the lab batch. If there is, if you find any, some of the experienced people who have done some programming should take the lead to shift over to some other team. It is not necessary that every team must do excellent programming work. Every team must write some programs, but there is a lot of work which I shall explain tomorrow when I describe the projects in greater details. The whole group, that is lab 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, or 5A, 5C, 5D, 5C, 5A, 5B, 5C, 5D, all of them will be doing just one project. It is called the mini national UID project for IIT campus. So you will be allocating a unique ID to every student on the campus and you will be using that unique ID with fingerprints for recording attendance or for permitting, whatever work. These are the four parts, these are the four sub-projects. Registration, classification and consolidation, duplicate detection and usage. For usage you will have to build an application. I shall describe these more details tomorrow but please understand that one batch, say batch A, could be doing duplicate detection. Batch B could be doing registration. Batch C could be doing this. Batch D could be doing this. How do you decide that? I would expect the team, the, the lab batch coordinators, four coordinators to sit together and decide what they would like to do. I could specify it easily. Incidentally, if the team formation is not done completely for any lab batch by tomorrow midnight, I shall use my authority as instructor in charge to reallocate teams for such batches. And I might do that very arbitrarily. So by Wednesday morning, either you decide properly balance five teams in every batch or I decide arbitrarily. That's the only choice. The purpose of these projects. Now this is extremely important for all of you to appreciate this. So far you have been doing individual assignments in labs or answering questions in quizzes or lab tests or mid-semester tests as individuals. Programming is not an individual activity. Programming is a group activity. So therefore the objective of the project is to expose you to and give you some practice in large software development. As I mentioned earlier, large software development requires version control. We shall use a system called CVS for version control. Any significant program development and checking and testing requires some online program debugging tool by which you can see where your pointers are moving or where data values are moving. We shall be using a graphical debugging tool called DDD. You will have to learn how to test programs, how to write test input and how to first write in advance what should be the correct output and test your programs accordingly. Enormous amount of documentation. All of this would have standards which shall be put on the web page for the projects and you can follow them. You should also be exposed to the notion of teamwork. The teamwork starts with forming good teams in the group. Professional peer evaluation. As I have mentioned earlier, I have used this technique in my postgraduate courses. This is the first time I am using it for a first year course. Out of 25 marks, 15 marks will be given for the project report by the TAs based on the project report evaluation. But 10 marks, which are for individuals, will be given by the lab batch based on the peer evaluation. I shall explain the process of peer evaluation. 
by and large, whatever marks you submit out of 10 will be allocated as your earned 10 marks. However, as I mentioned to the team leaders, if I suspect that the peer evaluation does not accurately reflect the work done, it is not necessarily programming work. It is all kind of work that is required for that project. If the work done is not commensurate with the marks, I reserve the right to conduct two sample vivas. I will take any two sample people from the whole batch and I'll conduct a viva. Now suppose you have given eight marks and ten marks to those two students and I detect that they deserve say nine marks and ten marks then my average mark is half mark more than what you have given. I will add that half mark to every student of the whole lab batch. On the other hand, if I detect that these two students actually deserve four marks each and not eight and ten, then you have given four and six marks more to these two students, the average works out to be five extra marks. I will deduct five marks from every student of that lab batch. So please understand, it's an extremely responsible activity. And I, that, that's the principle I have followed in peer evaluation. Well, you can mull over it later. May I have your attention, please? I know it is harsh, but that is how it is. You cannot get only the authority to give marks to yourselves without being accountable. I would like two minutes of your time. There's something that has been pending. I still not have got the final updated mark list of the mid-semester from my TS. It is quite likely, therefore, that this list might be changed. Once I get the final list, I will put it on the home web page. But however, it is with honor that I would like to recognize these people. Guru Raj Saveshwar, is he here? Yes, thank you. Namit Raval? Can't even see. Yes, Namit Raval is sitting here. Well done. Vinayak Gagrani, we saw him yesterday, he's written and sent a nice program. Ankush Jain, Ankush is here? Yes. Siddhesh Chobar? Where is Siddhesh? Yeah, that side. Okay. Udit Jalan? Good. Pratik Bhandari? Jerin Jolly? Long corner. Okay. Joy Khan, there. Raja Jain, Shiva Chandramauli, missing. Chandramauli is not here. Is there? Okay. And Nalamala Gautam Reddy, yeah, is there. There are at least three other names that I know who are special because they use binary search in a problem when it was not required to be used. Unfortunately, there may be many others. I do not know who had used binary search. I would request those few of you who actually use binary search in solving that problem. You remember the problem did not require you to binary, use binary search, but it stipulated that one of the errors was solved. And naturally, you should have used binary search, although it was more difficult to code online in an exam. But those few who did, they deserve the honor to be recognized and I would like their names to be known, which I will flash next time. Last request again, please give your anonymous feedback on the course on this side. It has been put up on the web. Please ensure, because the, your feedback is very important for me and my TAs to correct any problems that we have with the course delivery so that you can benefit from it. I am repeating this concession. There have been umpteen people. I have received some confession letters already, but there are many people who are inquiring that I had copied a program which has not yet been graded. I am going to resubmit it anyway. So do I have to give an apology letter? Please understand that the apology letter requested is not connected with any evaluation. It is connected with falling prey to a wrong temptation. And therefore, the punishment is for falling prey to that wrong temptation. It does not matter whether it had zero marks associated with that assignment. But if you have copied an assignment without giving credit from whom you have copied, then you have done a wrong thing for which you must confess.
So this I must have. There is absolutely, absolutely no debar from this. As I have said and I have repeated again, there will be no punishment except that in those assignments they will get zero marks, provided after the confession letter they also resubmit those assignments doing properly things on their own. Doesn't matter whether they are right or wrong. We are conducting, we have conducted seven assignments. I am extending the date of assignment submission, including any old assignments that you have submitted which were not correct. You have a chance to correct them and resubmit. I am telling my TAs to re-evaluate assignments, only those which are latest submission. So if you have submitted something earlier and that is right, leave it. But if you have some problem with that and you now have thought a better thing, you resubmit that assignment by rewriting it, that is perfectly fine. The last date for such submission is next Saturday. So you can submit all assignments including the last lab 7 assignment. And we will count best 5 out of 7. Ordinarily, I expect everyone to get 5 marks out of 7, at least 4, maybe 3. Those who have unfortunately copied somebody else's assignment may stand to lose at most 1 mark. It is not worth it. Please send your letters immediately because one thing I have, I have guaranteed on 13 February, which is the last date, by which time I expect to complete my comparison thing. If I do not get these confession letters and catch people who have copied, they will be given fail grade on 14th. That is guaranteed. Please don't get into that problem yourself and please don't force me to get into an extremely bad situation. I feel very hurt if I have to do that. There are some people who have mailed me saying that we have written this but we know some people have copied from our assignment. Such people need not worry. If they tell me in advance that they know some people have copied, if their names comes up in the matching, I will ignore those. If their names don't come up in the matching, uh, if their names come up in the matching and they have not informed me, they may be called for a discussion. But believe me, I have a speciality in spotting the original authors. No person who is innocent of copying will ever get any punishment. That I guarantee. However, others who have fallen to the temptation must confess and must not do this. It is bad actually. It is bad for you. Because you don't learn anything at all by copying and pasting or by changing some variable names or by shuffling some code. You don't learn anything at all. You learn a lot by attempting a difficult problem not necessarily getting the right solution. I want you to learn that. Thank you very much.